robotics, AI applied to construction, predictive models, and big data. This thematic block will be structured um, with a um, main speaker, with several main speakers, round tables, and we will remind you and ask you to please respect and keep to time. As our first speaker, we have Ivan Yach, Juni, founding partner of Tab Says from Barcelona. He's an architect and founder of the architectural firm Tab Says Barcelona. His projects are based on the search for good architecture from a social, economic, and building and environmental perspective. He combines professional practice with teaching. He was also visiting professor at several universities, nationally and internationally, and associate professor of the um, International University of Cata Catalonia Architectural School between 2012 and 2019. His projects have been received, have received awards and recognition in various international and local architectural um, spheres. And the title of his um, speech, Industrialized Construction um, with Prefab Elements um, in um, Concrete for Plurifamily Households. And I give you the floor, sir. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the conference organization and, th and actually thank them for the time that they have provided us to talk and provide our point of view. I'm going to briefly structure my intervention in two parts. We will first of all talk about a research project that we carried out within our firm in 2020, and then we're going to present the Pensi project, one that in, has innovated in aspects that we believe are pillars for good architecture. As I said, in 2020, together with the International University of Catalonia and Paralibilial, the Association of Industrialized um, Housing Organization, we carried out a study, a comparative study between industrialized concrete construction systems and traditional construction systems for high rise buildings. And we wanted to um, evaluate um, how useful some of the techniques were from an integral point of view bearing in mind morphological, economic, and environmental aspects. For that, we carried out a fictitious project of two buildings, a lineal building and a tower building. On the, the first building was 12 by 47 meters, lower levels where we had um, commercial use um, areas and four levels where we had different types of um, houses and flats. The second building is a tower, which has an underground um, level, um, ground level and eight floors. For the traditional system, we envisaged a concrete structure in situ with pillars and um, weight-bearing pillars in the area of the stairs. Um, the facade um, is of ceramic and um, in the industrialized system, the building um, presented is a prefab structure of concrete and load-bearing walls in the areas of the stairs and the lifts. Um, the facade is uh, made of panels um, of concrete of um, eight millimeters. Once we had analyzed both projects, 
we did a comparative where we extracted the following conclusions. And this is a very um, comprehensive project that is accessible in the VVL uh, website. We're currently um, adding a bit more of um, information because we did this in 2020. With regards to the morphological um, study, one of the main um, advantages of the um, prefab structures carried out with alveolar um, roots. This uh, means that, um, as Iñaki pointed out, that we have um, flexibility inside um, the buildings because we have access to a lot of light. We have structural elements that we can do away with in on the inside of the building, which means that it can be adapted for other uses in the future. The industrialized structure allows the creation of open systems that can be adapted at any time and provide greater flexibility in the interior for the dwellings. And this is a very important aspect when we durability um, and the thermal inertia um, in facades and in different parts of the building is very important for the future. With regards to the environmental studies, what we did is analyze the life cycle of the different um, buildings in their construction phases and we analyzed it in comparative tables which allowed us to analyze elements like security and health and control of quality which are very important um, factors in building. The construction of a structure and facade with industrialized systems um, that are productive in um, environmentally controlled um, areas provide a much better product. Um, the risk factors of on-site construction are therefore mitigated. So the risk factors when we build um, in situ are a lot higher than when we build off-site. With regards to the environment, this study also demonstrates that there is a significant reduction in the environmental impacts in the case of industrialized building, especially with regards to the generated waste during construction, which are pretty much um, eliminated. In these tables, which are part of our comparative study. In the lineal building, we see a reduction of 20.10% of CO2 emissions, a 15.11 embedded energy reduction, and a reduction of the 97.49% of the waste generated. In the tower building, it is even higher the reduction, we got a 35.95% reduction in CO2 emissions, a 31.7% embedded energy reduction, and the um, construction waste generated, we reduced 97.67%. And finally, our study focused our research in the compa economic comparison of both possibilities. And we have borne in mind all of the factors that um, influence the construction and um, use of the building, the materials, the um, outsourcing, the financing, the, cons the hiring, and the um, deadlines as well. In this comparative economic study for the um, lineal building, the pen is in 9.99%, 9 29.9%, and the peg is 0.56% above the traditional building. With regards to the tower building, the pen is 2.15% above the traditional building, and 
The traditional one is 6.39% with respect to the industrialized building. The study allowed us to um, really reinforce what we had already foreseen. Um, this building, building constructed in 2019, is the first building between um, carried out with uh, prefab concrete blocks. And its construction solution is sustainable with the objective of minimizing the um, building deadlines, um, the execution time was 12 months, reduced the environmental impact, implementing a constructive process which was precise, um, clean and safe. This building is situated in a um, hospital, Calle Transversal. It's between two buildings, an industrial building and a housing building. It's a 15 by 12 meters. It's got a lower level floor plus three floors on top. And this is a modeling of the structure of the building. And here we have images of its construction. We did it quickly, um, precisely, and cleanly. The central nucleus, we have 20 centimeter um, concrete panels that bore weight, which also holds the um, staircase and the lift. And this staircase is a good example um, of of construction in an industrialized manner versus traditional construction of staircases. We needed all sorts of construction aids. Um, we needed to, um, of course, um, do all the processes there. If you construct this very um, staircase somewhere else, um, it was installed and assembled very, very quickly. As, we, as I pointed out, we have this central nucleus of the structure in both facades, that of the street and that of the patio. We have concrete pillars, um, 40 by 40, and um, structures that bear these um, alveolar plaques. One of the handicaps that we had is that we needed to do wrought iron structures of more than 25 centimeters and the compression layer um, allowed us to reduce it to 22. On the other hand, the facade was of course uh, completely built with concrete um, elements and it had um, also balconies which um, also were built in concrete and the only element that we added was the um, um, yellow elements that were made in iron which contrasted a lot with the white um, concrete of the facade. This is the inside facade of the patio area, of course built with the same elements. I would also like to highlight the interior of the building, which also reflects this um, natural way of construct constructing in such a way that we don't um, cover the materials, but we let them show the staircase, for instance, is made of concrete. The panels are also made of concrete and they weren't covered. Um, the areas um, that provide, um, that, that allow the views are also um, included and we use um, specific um, 
concrete blocks to separate the different um, areas and they were also not covered up. It's a very natural and clean way of designing. We're in a building that is not hiding anything. We don't even um, have um, anything that covers and that allows us to reduce um, our environmental impact. I wanted to finish touching on the three aspects that um, we focused on on the comparative study, which is really linked to the way that we design um, and we think that these are um, very important advantages uh, of working with industrialized systems in terms of sustainability. We have managed to reduce the CO2 emissions, reduce the embedded energy cons consumption, reduce waste during the construction phase, reduce um, lab labor risks, and of course the improvement of the thermal inertia, inertia in walls and slabs. And in terms of the economic impact, we have seen a reduction in the execution time and this building was destined for um, rentals, so that is also very useful. The maintenance also was reduced in terms of rehabilitation and um, substitution of elements. This is also quite important because the maintenance costs are lowered. The design of a building also has to bear that in mind because we have to think about the building as a whole and um, it's the, it starts at the beginning of the project and it has to bear in mind all of these variables from the beginning. Thank you very much. Let's get the next presentation ready. Gracias, Iván. Seguimos con la segunda We will continue with the second invited or guest speaker in the second block. The speaker's name is Unai Coronio Erecha, who is sales and marketing director at Egoin in Vizcaya. He has a degree in business and economics from the Basque Public University and he also forms part of the second generation of the Egoin family business with 23 years of entrepreneurship and initiative in relation to sustainable industrialized construction in southern Europe. He's developed and implemented Egoin in Spain and also in foreign markets such as the UK, Andorra and the Caribbean. Unai, you have the floor. I would like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me and I would also like to congratulate you for its organization, the second edition of the conference, and I'm sure that you will celebrate many, many editions in the future, which is a good sign. This morning we listened to different presentations which touched upon the efficiency of buildings, passive standards, construction methods, not necessarily taking account exclusively the materials used, but ensuring that the design of the project is efficient. Reference also been made to user comfort in buildings in relation to conditioning, heating, cooling or mechanical ventilation. And another very important point, health. And not just the user's health, but as Ivan mentioned, the health of the building itself. And to achieve that, it's essential that the architectural design project is well prepared. So, 
I'm going to approach this but from the perspective of construction employing wood and the way in which we consider we can improve all of these different aspects. And I would add even one more, which is the carbon impact on construction. Using more wood in construction will ensure that the impact of our sector, which is fairly substantial, accounting for approximately 50% of CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions to the atmosphere, And I'd like to present the way in which we consider that we can help transform the sector. As I explained, we're a construction company, a family business at origin. We've been operating the sector for around 30 years. As I mentioned at the beginning, we also operate in international markets and not just in Spain. So we've repeated projects in the UK, France, Portugal, as well as activities in the Caribbean. We cover the entire process, from forest management through to the cutting of the raw material, it's drying. We have an engineering department with more than 20 engineers working on our projects. as well as the development of structural products for uh, or structural wooden products for their use in construction and also logistics and their use in different projects. In terms of our facilities and installed capacity, we have facilities in Spain, not just egoing facilities, but also there are facilities of other companies that work in the use of wood and construction. So local wood, for example, can be used to build any type of wooden building. We have our company headquarters, the registered office, which is based in Vizcaya in 2013. We set up a second factory for laminated wood. And we're just about to inaugurate a third factory in Lituano, in Lituano, in Vitoria, for the production of CDT. We specialize in each plan, industrial carpentry in Echitua, the manufacture of laminated wood in Egoin, and the manufacture of CDT, of laminated panels in Avertia. As regards the company's values, well, these are underpinned on sustainability by sustainability and our commitment in the projects in which we collaborate. We're also committed to guaranteeing quality in all of our structural elements. Four key axes, sustainable forest management, engineering. We try to embark on the projects in these collaborative projects very much at the beginning accompanying the different management teams responsible for supervising the project. We engage in the own manufacture of different wood solutions using local raw materials. Our sawing or cutting capacity is approximately 40,000 cubic meters per year, 35,000 cubic meters in terms of the production of CDT and 15,000 cubic meters in terms of the production of CDCLT. We can also produce uh, timber frame. We have a special line where we're able to produce timber frame formwork, 75,000 square meters per year on average. And what about the logistics and assembly of any type of buildings? Well, we can do that as well. Here's a number of buildings as examples. In order to cater for a growing demand for the use of wood in construction, over the last six years we've grown from being approximately 80 people. We have from 48 to 83, 86 people in Nguyen. And what about our soul, our spirit, which revolves around these axes in the economic, social and environmental spheres? This is not just done for our shareholders, but also for 
Eguin's employees and collaborators and of course for our customers. A very short video which will give you an idea of the size of our facilities in Chippa, Albertia and Goin where the soaring facilities and the CLT facilities are located. So I think that an image speaks more than a thousand words and I think it was worthwhile just showing you that video. Public challenges and initiatives. What do we see as challenges in the sector? One is installed industrial capacity to cater for growing demand and the use of organic materials in the construction sector, for example wood. Thanks to wood-based projects, traction in the forest side or the rural sphere, so that forest owners are more encouraged and will continue to invest in those rural areas, the aim being to improve our hilled regions. Again, socialising the importance of wood, we've seen this today in some of the earlier presentations and I think the use of wood has largely gone unknown or ignored in Spain. It was abandoned in the 1960s and 70s in construction and thanks to companies such as ours we're gradually trying to introduce wood more and more in the construction sector. A study was carried out within the scope of the European program in which we participated and the results were very interesting. If, for example, you were to ask somebody in the south of Europe, the participants were France, Aquitaine, uh, the Basque country, Navarre and Portugal. If you were to ask citizens who would build a home in from wood, then only 10% of the respondents said that they would build a home from wood. However, if 
you were to ask them about if any of them had worked in a wooden building and 90% that said that they had. It's important to mention the need to not just increase the social awareness of society, but also children. It's not just about adults, but also children. We're working on different entrepreneurial projects with nearby schools. We're also working on vocational training in dual programs to bring companies closer to schools and in this way socialize the use of wood to a greater extent. There are children, for example, that may believe that cutting a tree is bad because there are teachers that continue to chill, teach their children that cutting trees is bad. And even perhaps even in um, more vocational training programs or master's programs in Spain, we're trying to change this opinion. So in vocational training, many of the young people consider that rural areas or this type of sector is very attractive. They can see that it's a tech-friendly and tech-heavy sector with uh, very great potential for development in the future. So another challenge is to increase the percentage use of wood in industrial con industrialized construction of buildings in Spain because it is not employed very much. So following along those lines, I would just like to present the investment that we've carried out in Ecoin to cater for growing demand in the market and increase our, or enhance our competitiveness as a company and quantitatively speaking increase the supply of wood-based construction solutions twofold. As I mentioned earlier, we're located in Legotio, which is near Vitoria. The facility covers a service area of 60,000 square meters with 30,000 square meters corresponding to production installations, production facilities. And in approximately two weeks' time, we will have doubled our production capacity. Quality of improvement insofar as we are able to better prepare for the future. CLT regulation, greater permeability of CLT, cross laminated timber, and greater fire resistance and also better acoustic acoustics. Qualitatively, we will be able to use different types of wood within the same structural element. So, investigating different tree species and carrying out research, we're talking about species that may be less resistant for mechanical purposes for LT. As regards public initiatives that we consider could support the sector and help the wood-based industri industrial sector, which actually take into account the value of the contribution of wood to reducing the carbon footprint. There are different architects that would participate in this through different tenders, and also public initiatives or public tenders, which will enable investors or private developers to embrace efficient passive construction solutions with zero carbon emissions and thus enhancing the buildability of these type of buildings or plots and also benefiting from tax breaks in order to encourage the use of this type of material. And on the public side, in relation to social housing, the idea would be to continue to promote new investments in public housing based on high or stringent energy efficiency criteria which will improve the environmental impact and also the social impact because we consider that both of those objectives can be achieved at the same time. And finally, the core, the nitty gritty, what's really important, we have to promote sustainable forest management in each district or region with raw material. I know that I had to skip through this very quickly, I only had 15 minutes, 
But before I stop, I would like to show you some photos of different projects, which will show you that it's possible to build any type of building out of wood. From a social centre, this is one in Barcelona, where the entire building has been made from wood, and four floors, and even the external cladding is made from wood. And this is also accompanied by a specific type of treatment, so that the wood will improve its fire resistance classification. And you can see that the assembly process is a fully industrialized process, which helps achieve important sustainability uh, objectives with isolated thermal capacity with this incorporated um, well and also solar panels on the roofing. The priority that's given to the roof and the interior is very significant, leaving a lot of structural wood elements visible. As Ivan, our colleague, mentioned, these type of prefabricated staircases, in this case made from wood, these are then transported and installed directly on site. Or this office building, which we've just handed the keys over in Barcelona. It's one of the largest buildings in Spain currently made entirely from wood. Well, leaf and Priam. And it's been constructed entirely in Barcelona. It's this building here. You can see the construction process. It's a hybrid system. It's not a pure CLT system, but it also con it contains CLT laminated porticos, horizontal wooden planks, CLT planks, and also a type of exterior facade wall which has also been manufactured from wood. And this video gives you an idea of the construction process. It's very, very quick, of course, I'm showing you the video. Uh, another headquarters, Nature Klima, certified with, by, with the Passive House Standard in San Sebastián. Or oh, the Green Impulse, another emblematic building which was also certified with the Passive House Standard in Lugo using local raw materials from Galicia. And it was also manufactured in Egoin. And there's the finished product and then some simple family homes. You constructed making industrial maize using these special wooden cornerstones and also cornerstones obtained from the quarry which is 10 kilometers away from the plot. The entire building has been constructed using industrial methods and also clad in wooden elements and there you can see the finishing elements well, we can also leave structural elements internally and also leave all of these installations as you can see them there on the screen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for your presentations. Very, very interesting. I'm so sorry to have to time keep so strictly. Now we're going to move on to the scientific um, panel. The first um, presentation, wood concrete composite products for low carbon housing, an option for the future. Antonio Gallego Molina from the University of Granada. Antolino, sorry, I give you the floor. Me han dicho antes, no te equivoques que es Antolino, no Antonio. Yo, RQR, Antolino. Hay que reivindicar un nombre que es totalmente diferente, Antonio. ¿No? Da igual. Da igual, ¿no? Da igual. Ahora pierdo yo el tiempo con el... So, um, I made a mistake with your name, Antolino. It won't happen again. No se ve. Unfortunately, we can't see my presentation. Yes, let's see. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
it is an honor to be here in the second edition of this um, international conference um, on innovation and sustainability in social housing of Andalusia, and also in my university, in my um, technical school, where we um, actually follow the process of innovation and research for new products very closely. And that is what I want to talk to you about in this um, presentation, which um, really um, brings together the two um, presentations that we have heard before, Ivan's and Unai's. One that was talking about the um, prefabricated concrete and the other one, the industrialized wood, wood production. If I asked you a general question with regards to the beginning of the forest fires um, season here in Andalusia, if we asked a question to um, some to builders or to someone that's going to build their own house. If we ask them what you could do or what could they do to fight against forest fires in their region, in their village, and really we d couldn't really foresee their um, response. They might say, well, I would help in putting out the fire. But to put out fires scientifically proven, we know that we need to um, use wood for building because we get rid of fuel from the actual mountains. We push forth um, the growing of new trees, which are younger, and allow for the putting out of fires quicker. We have a social responsibility and environmental responsibility in the decisions that we make to stop forest fires. And um, crossing our arms and not doing anything, thinking that politicians don't do anything, really, that's not a very proactive answer. We must be proactive and using wood and construction together with other materials seems to be the most useful scientific option. Oh, something happened here with the presentation, excuse me. We also have to analyze this from the point of view of what we have learned in using wood for, as a construction material. It was the first construction material that was used by human beings. But we have to take a look back and use the technology that we have, technology that it evolves, and there are universities, research centers, and private initiatives propose new materials for construction. Building with wood in, is something that is in vogue in um, Europe and in Spain. These skyscrapers are built, their structures are built with wood in their structures and there's not small buildings. In Andalusia, the construction with wood is also seeing a rise, especially in Malaga and Cadiz, and especially what the material used is CLT, cross-laminated timber, and it is being used for um, high-rise construction. And it has a limitation, um, six floors, and um, also has the limitation of not necessarily needing to use too much wood, but it has to be combined. The um, wood is being used for um, light structures, and it can't go as as we said, we can't really um, go beyond four floors. So what can we do to innovate with this? We think that a reasonable option based 
science of materials and its technology is mixing wood with concrete in an intelligent, in, in a useful way. That is why we can do prefabricated mixes of concrete and wood where we use less wood but perhaps using it in more buildings, making it something that is um, used in construction. Use this also in the construction of um, areas that allow for light to go into the different areas of the buildings. And CLT for um, construction in high rise. Also, reducing the carbon footprint of constructing only with concrete. That is the base of the um, project Lifewood for the Future, which entails innovation towards the future, a project financed for, by the European Union to mitigate climate change. The funds have been provided for the innovation and to try and diminish the effects of global warming and try to um, reduce it as much as possible. It is in this light that we are developing two products. One that um, values local Andalusian wood in a product that is um, a laminated wooden beam using um, different ways of um, joining it, glued together. So we have the poplar in the center, which is a much lighter um, type of wood, using this um, Type of wood means that we can use a poplar that it grows in Granada that is locally sourced and also that dis diminishes its um, the population of poplars that we have here. And also, um, we would have on the top of this beam pine. So the use of local wood means that we reinforce the development of rural areas that could grow this type of tree mm, and we would have a more resistant and lighter product to create beans. We have the scientific data here mm, where we actually analyzed if we um, broke these beams what would happen if we had beams only of pine, beams only of poplar or beams of mixed, and here we have the results. Uh, we would need 15,000 megapascals if it, these beams were only made of pine. If it was only made of poplar, it would only require a, a much lower um, a production of, of strength because it would mean that, it, because this type of material is very um, malleable. However, using both, we get the best part of both worlds. So a prefabricated mixed product of wood and concrete, we would get a highly resistant product, which is um, very good for structural um, areas. It is lighter than concrete because it uses wood. It is valid for um, areas um, in high construction and we're not only using wood but using concrete means that we can step for instance on concrete but we can use the underlying structure built in wood. It is a prefabricated structure and it provides um, acoustic insulation and it can be industrially prefabricated. We have a simulation of the CO2 emissions per square meter. In grey we have the emissions of concrete and in green we have the emissions of um, the wood. And um, if we combine both of them, we would have a zero um, carbon footprint, which means that the concrete provides the resistance to compression and the wood uh, provides the reduction of the carbon footprint.
The key of this product is the connection between the two of these. This, of course, is supported on um, research and numbers. The project is going to develop both of these products with um, CE labeling and in collaboration with a company of technological base, which is called Iberoland Timber and Technology, um, in spin-off of the University of Granada, who intends to commercialize these two projects and serving itself with um, local timber. Um, the um, the building of the um, that the regional minister pointed out to the building that was going to be built here for um, young um, people is going to use timber of local sourcing. So this is going to be a spin-off of the University of Granada that intends to revive the local sources um, that could provide would because the mountainous areas of Spain um, would be revived and that is important because they're almost um, uninhabited at the moment. This helps us to fight against um, lack of population, it helps to preserve the mountainous areas and this, the responsibilities that you have as architects, um, promoters, constructors, universities, we all um, achieve many objectives by using wood. We, this spin-off is quite a singular uh, company in the south of Spain, but we have the resources close to us. These areas in the province of Granada is where we can find poplar and the other areas where we find laricio pine wood are on the northern part of the um, of Andalusia region. And this would allow us to have locally sourced construction materials. And as Unai said, it is important to um, use resources that are um, nearby. Right. We also received the support of our own research group, the WIMBA, the um, research unit of structural word of Andalusia, WIMA, which um, has um, its first research project in the um, Azucarera de San Isidro, which we visited today. Thank you very much for your attention. And I apologize, I called you Antonio and I got your name wrong and on top of it I told you that you had to wrap up your presentation. I have to insist on the time allocated because I feel very bad about having to insist that people cut their presentation short but there's no way around it due to the huge amount of interesting information that we have to present. Okay, well, we open up the new presentation, a scientific presentation entitled The Design of a Flexible Collective Residential Project, which will be presented by Amadeo Ramos Caranza from Seville University. Good afternoon. Firstly, I would like to thank the Congress organizers for giving me the opportunity to very briefly present a research study that is currently still underway. The title of my presentation is The Design of a Flexible and Modifiable Collective Housing System. 
This is a research project with the participation of other people or more people than are named on the slide. The aim of this research is to develop an architectural project for collective housing which is based on the design of a structural system in order to cater for diverse demand in different situations and scenarios in different contexts, which has to be flexible so it can be adapted to the requirements of future inhabitants. To achieve this, it has to be modifiable, particularly in order to adapt it over time. For this purpose, we require light, recyclable architecture, 100%, based on simple and industrializable construction solutions in compliance with existing requirements regarding comfort, habitability and decent housing. And following this aim of the project, we can also help to address climate change, which is also encompassed within the SDGs, and also hope Hopefully work towards nearly zero consumption buildings incorporating materials with low environmental impact. For this research we developed a methodology which is fairly standard in architectural projects. On the one hand, given the state of the technology, it responds very much to objectives defined by other architects and researchers and there are certain architectural precedents corresponding to prefabricated light housing architectures based on the use of lightweight prefabricated systems which responds to different user demands, economy and flexibility in each situation. These are the different concepts that we addressed and these actually date back to a decade in which it was felt that prefabrication could be one of the major solutions to the housing problem. And we took a lot of interest in the definitions that were developed by Richard Lewin Davies, Davies on socio-technological environments, which corresponds to the ability of prefabricated architecture to generate areas of identity without causing rejection of new technology construction processes. We also have to understand this is unlimited architecture as being the capacity for internal change and also the future adaptation of a building. In 1950, Gerard Coleman also developed his idea of design range, which means that a building as a flexible spatial structure reaches its most suitable condition when the number of elements is minimal for a high number of combinations. In the same year, Jonah Friedman referred to the convertibility of spaces, a notion of flexibility which is based on the ability to modify surfaces without altering the load-bearing structure. As regards other pre or previous architectures that we are probably familiar with, we took a lot of interest in the work of Jean Prouvé, particularly his central core prototype due to its dual solution of providing, providing this load-bearing central structure and also free and variable architectural styles. The architecture developed by the Keck brothers, the future house dating from 1933, creating a space around the facade where different functions could be performed, and also the interior space, thus enhancing the typological convertibility. Similar solutions were tested by Norman Foster, which were technologically more advanced, in which formwork was considered to serve as a technical uh, space that could be monitored for different functions. And finally, the system, the urban system developed by Eckhard Schultz, which considered that the architecture has a broad design sphere of design similar to that presented in the 1950s by Kalman. The results of these different research projects has given rise to a 100% recoverable, flexible and modifiable system which has been designed as a basic building prototype. It's almost like a minimum element as from which it would be possible to develop upwards and also with other types of horizontal configurations comprising 14 modules, each measuring 120 by a system which combines criteria that have been analysed with central uh, bands and also um, load-bearing facades, but also the possibility of developing other functions and also for configuring living spaces. The other basic building prototype can be used to develop up to seven types of buildings which will actually provide 45 possible combinations of the same building. 
they're not just recyclable, these products and materials, but also the typological types. This image that we're showing you is one of the combinations that have been studied and the way in which buildings can be transformed according to their typological variability. Their spatial organization and function could be similar to this scheme here. In line with this uh, system of central and perimetral bands, the central one which enables the passive conditioning of the interior and also the inclusion of clean energy collectors. In the central area, the more the water-based systems, community systems, vertical installations, duplex communications, community communications, energy collection systems, temporary accommodation adjustments. Uh, for duplexes or divided sections. This has also been confirmed in the design of one of the 45 possible combinations, highlighting that all of the homes are adapted to the building requirements established in the regional governments of Andalusia, in conformity with universal accessibility criteria, so that the buildings are 100% adaptable. It's not just the question of adapting a bedroom or a bathroom. This concept of universal accessibility is a sustainability concept. As one of the first references stemming from this research, we can highlight, for example, the presentation to the Spanish Patent Office of the design which is currently pending authorization following external examination and the substantive report. This can be, uh, we'll have to see exactly what the result of that is. We're currently modeling the system. We obviously have to uh, verify the system to determine whether we've managed to fulfill the principles relating to the architecture and research that was carried out in the 1950s. Efficiency, optimization, the, trans, uh, the, the transformational study of the, or the the translational uh, study of the structure. We can say that the f initial results of the research point to various hypotheses whereby it's viable to develop this type of system which offers this type of variability. And we can also use products that are respectful or environmentally friendly. And this system can also comply with the uh, convertibility and habitability criteria or also a range of eliminated uh, architectural design as promoted by Kalman. And at this stage, we're currently studying the existing market in terms of the use of industrialized prefabricated materials supported by sustainable criteria, life cycle, the 2030 agenda, all of these things which will gradually allow us to incorporate the design of this prototype in our work. We also seek diverse options so that we're able to create architecture which will be accepted by future inhabitants and which is in line with social technological environments. We're also pending the response from the sector. Companies that will a, be able to support this project and take advantage of the benefits and opportunities of the circular economy and also improve the development of local production. Thank you very much for your time. Seguimos con la siguiente comunicación. Now we're going to move on to the next scientific communication. BIM sustainability methodology, methodology in public administration. Gonzalo Pulido López will present as the researcher. And a round of applause, please, because we're all very serious after lunch. And I see that the company is Entropia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the organization um, for creating this conference, uh, for allowing us to share our ideas, actually. And we're going to talk about BIM sustainability methodology in public administration. We're going to um, analyze success stories and our proposals for improvement. I'm Gonzalo Pulido, and I'm the project manager um, of Entropia and Edding Marketing Engineering. The research that we carried out um, stems from 
three uh, projects that we carried out um, for Avra, a project in Seville, in Camas, 36 uh, social housing, um, 18 in Moreda, in Granada, social housing, and 10 in Albujarra, Granada, and social housing. We have created all three projects in BIM, and um, the uh, building that we're going to analyze is an energy improvement project of 10 dwellings in Albujarra. The project is part of the Sudoy Energy Push project of an interreg program of the European Union. And the interventions are in thermal insulation and say in the courtyard of the interior and cladding of the housing and insulation of the roof. The carpentry had been um, changed in previous intervention. For um, the gathering of data, um, we used point cloud technology um, and we needed um, really um, a lot of information and technology to be able to generate the digital um, technology. The technicians of Avra created the whole project in BIM and all the information of the constructive elements were available. You can supervise the model and select it. We have access to the information of the um, dimensions, the plans, the sections, and we can also um, supervise the model visually analyzing each of the elements. The green ones are, um, are what are used inside the courtyard. Then we also generate the, the uh, plans with um, all of the surfaces and we have specific data from the um, from all of the information that we gather. And this BIM technology was very useful for the certifications because we um, bought, we could understand what we needed. The, um, the element in red were the old elements and the element in green um, were those the new ones that we created and all this has been measured and um, created by BIM technology. We also carried out um, energy certification uh, which um, the indicator starts E um, in E and we managed to achieve a C. The Sudoe program requires um, that we install temperature, um, CO2 and relative humidity sensors as well as a control panel that sends all of this information via Wi-Fi. This information is gathered in a website using SCADA and daily we gather the temperature, the CO2 and the humidity every day. The results that we have after th um, the analysis of these three housing areas, we have the same problems in this in the three um, buildings. But BIM allows us to create um, information for the public tendering processes. BIM as a methodology uses a basic premise that the effort of the whole project should be done in the early stages of the project, which is not something that we are used to doing because we tend to leave it till the end. In the rest of um, in the next step, we study the tendering scheme, which is based on the project um, phase and the um, contractor phase. We um, initially tender the BIM consultancy, um, and then um, the next step is the BIM contractor has to redo the drafted project. They have to include it within BIM anew. In the construction phase, we have two new tenders. One, BIM consultancy, and that has to redo the project, and two, the contractor for both. And they both have to reanalyze the project and prepare all of these changes. As the work progresses, the BIM models are modified and updated, and um, generally it's disconnected from the project that drafted, and this perversion of the project work model is what cause, causes duplication of tasks and documentation, which really is um, something that um, delays um, all the process. Having analyzed all of this, what we propose is on the one hand, um, eliminate the duplicity of um, consult um, BIM consultants so that they are only included in the project phase and that they can continue throughout the rest of the phase. phases. The second step is 
that the um, tendering process uh, for the BIM consultancy be done before the project is presented so that they can help throughout. And three, which is the most conflictive one, is that the um, um, contractor phase be done in the project phase because they could help with um, documentation and making decisions within the project. And as a conclusion, basically, is that what we do with these changes is um, implement the BIM methodology so that all of the agents be included in the project within the early phases. And what we achieve, on the other hand, is um, gain time that can be um, well used in the construction phase. All of the BIM methodology um, used in BIM is aligned with the sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda and the tools that we have to develop it. this are Alimbrium and Sustainable Development Tools, which are um, sustainable seals or sustainable um, uh, certifications. These um, have to be used um, while we are developing the pro project, like the HULC um, seals. And they provide us with strategies that we can also use throughout the project. It is also important um, to monitor sensors, also proposed by sustainable um, practices. And they're going to be very useful to make decisions in the planning phase and choose the right project. They will help also to justify projects to interested parties and community. They will help to communicate the total value and benefits, and also to help with the permanent value and reducing costs. As future lines um, of action, we propose incorporate, or incorporating all to all of the um, tendering processes for rehabilitation, a technological aspect which um, includes um, sensors to measure. Um, we also would require a technical team that is um, able to read and interpret the data, carry out a register and control of all of this data, create a catalogue for our interventions that can be a guide for professionals and technicians, and organize this in um, a way that it can help other um, Andalusian agencies. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank um, my colleagues Antonio Cornejo and Antonio Martinez. This would not have been possible without the help of the technicians of the um, provinces of Seville and Granada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gonzalo. Amadeo? Amadeo. Is Amadeo here? Localizado. Located. Amadeo, lo tienen por ahí. Y continuamos con la última comunicación. Continue with the final scientific presentation in this block. A presentation which will focus on sustainable intelligent design in BIM, building information modeling. The presentation will be presented by Bernadette Soust Verdaguer. I'm not sure if I've pronounced her name correctly. A round of applause for Bernadette, please. Universidad de Sevilla. University of Seville. Well, first thing I would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to present this study orally. For me, it's a great honour to be here at the conference this year, representing the research team from the University of Seville. Speak closer to the microphone. 
apologise for having a bit of a cold. So my voice is a little lower than it would normally be. So anyway, as I was saying, I'd like to thank the organisers for giving us the opportunity to present this study. And given the studies that have been presented in this block, I think it was also worthwhile reflecting on the different topics that have been presented. And I think that this presentation will help us to, let's say, finalise this sector, this section. We've also talked about the measurement of the carbon footprint and the importance of using low CO2 emission products. We engage in the development of tools, of BIM tools, digital tools, which can help designers to take better decisions during the design process. So I feel it's fairly interesting and it's uh, good that we've been asked to wrap up this module. And I'd like to present some opportunities or possibilities that we are working on. We've also worked with AVRA and we continue to work with AVRA through research projects which gradually evolve in each of these different topic areas. Well, just to give you a very quick introduction regarding life cycle assessment, which has been mentioned earlier, and this is something that we should all become very familiar with, because the carbon footprint and the measurement of that footprint is so important today. Everything that is a result of human activity and its impact on the environment should be more familiar to all of us, particularly in relation to scientific methodologies that seek to measure these parameters. And I always like to show this image. It provides a closer insight into the methodology, the reduction of emissions, the reduction of the impact of a given product in the environment. And this serves as a methodology to quantify inputs and outputs into and from a system. It seems very simple. And given the complexity of the processes that have to be included, but internally, it requires rigorous supervision and follow-up of all of the steps to ensure that the data obtained are valid. Well, this methodology has been used for many years. It's been standardized by ISO standards internationally. There are also other European standards which simplify the application of this methodology in the construction sector. Well, specifically, we use this methodology. It does involve a certain degree of complexity. And it's a question of not just incorporating the environmental dimension into the assessment, but also the economic and social dimensions as well. The specific way of measuring the process, measuring the impacts throughout the life cycle, also allows us to incorporate other emissions, parameters and data in accordance with the rigorous approach I mentioned earlier. So our research is basically focused on that methodology and what we do is develop tools that will allow us to calculate more equivalent weightings. The challenge, however, is on the economic side. There will be a response to certain indicators, a specific way of measuring. The environmental dimension will also be accompanied by specific parameters or indicators. In this case, on the economic side, we will measure in euros. On the environmental side, we will measure based on CO2 emissions. And in terms of the social dimension, it's hours of work. 
This methodology itself is extremely complete because it allows us to measure sustainability incorporating these different dimensions but it's accompanied by the challenge that they cannot be they're not intercomparable and that is where the challenge lies it's about how we can integrate multi criteria systems in the assessment and this is all done in BIM in the early design stages I apologize for running through the presentation very quickly, says the lady, and that I'm unable, due to the time constraints, to provide you with more details and some of the developments behind all of this. But initially, we also aim to reduce the work involved in data gathering. So what we did is we produced a database which would uh, allow certain decisions to be taken and decisions that the person does not have to take when thinking about the life cycle assessment and also the sensitivity of the life cycle which is increased which is actually even more complex and on that basis our approach seeks to simplify that process relating each of the component elements in the building enriching that information to develop the plugin that i'm going to describe later so the objectives of the study focused on the following. The development of this digital tool which will allow us to compare different construction solutions and also integrating the environmental, economic and social dimensions and again ensure that it could be synchronously applied in real time in BIM. Again this has been based very much on prior studies and research so what we did with this was to enrich much of the information in this BIM library that we gradually developed uh, focusing on multi-criteria analyses in order to compare those different dimensions that were not comparable previously. This gives you an idea of the plug-in, which has not been used in real time, the measurement of window solutions, and it will show how each of these solutions that we have developed in this BIM object library can also achieve certain environmental, economic and social results. And the comparison of three solutions, there was one of uh, aluminium, one of PVC and another of wood. So with three, these three solutions we obtained values and in line with the, everything that we referred to in this module so far, the best results were obtained for wood. And these are the types of results that we can obtain through the use of the plugin. What you can see here on the slide is that three types of projects have to be developed so that these can then be recorded to achieve the final results. I've just got one minute to go, otherwise I'll try to speed up. Anyway, the idea was just to give you a brief insight into the operation of the plugin. Plug it's fairly simple. And so far as it's rather intuitive, I'd also like to mention some points regarding the user interface. We're currently trying to improve this. That requires some additional work. And this will depend very much on the information that we are able to present. And I'll finish there and just show you the final results of the comparison of the three solutions, which is perhaps the most interesting part of the study. The final solution, which is one that we're also developing, in this case wood, well that's the end of the video, and in terms of the conclusions of this study, I mentioned that it's still under development. And the conclusions that we can draw from the study is that we've managed to integrate in the analysis using this multi-criteria methodology. We've also been able to provide real-time viewing of the results 
And as regards future research and development, it would be important to enhance the value that's been obtained with these results using other types of solutions in building envelopes and this way have a larger library based on the assessment of more homes. And this is the final test that would appear in the plugin, which gives you an idea of the weighting exercise that we performed. And this attributes a percentage of importance to each of the variables. So those are the details and the conclusions when I touched upon those earlier. And I apologise for going over time a little bit. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you found it interesting. Continuamos. We shall continue with our invited speakers. The next speaker. Um, please, I will ask you to come up to the stage. Please um, come and join me, Fernando, Javier. And while you sit, I'm going to talk about Fernando Cosgallon Lopez from um, the Higher Technical School of Building Engineering and of the University of Valencia, um, PhD of the Technical School of Building Engineering, Director of the Housing Observatory, um, Chair for the Polytechnic University of Valencia. His research, uh, his main research, is based on the implementation of industrialized processes in building and management of projects with BIM methodology. He was um, a technical director of BAMI at the um, Valencian community. He was also a director of Metro Valcesa, the most important um, real estate um, floated on the stock exchange. He um, also worked in other companies so, and was president of the Grupo Agora. He's director of the chair um, on housing observatory of the uh, Polytechnic University of Valencia. And his, um, he's going to speak about technology and humanity, how industrialization and BIM can help to improve universal access to housing. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to be here um, today um, in my school and in such a beautiful um, place as Granada. Content has been fantastic, and I thank Juanma for the opportunity to be here. And without further ado, I shall start. What you see here is um, the fruit of a research carried out with um, students. There was a terrible explosion um, a while ago in Bata, in um, New Guinea, and um, they almost destroyed the city. And so um, the students were asked to build um, a house for an emergency. What materials they were going to use, evidently it was going to be wood. And with what type of wood? The wood that you would see here is the one um, from the forests of Teruel in um, in New Guinea, it would be um, carried out with locally sourced wood. Our students designed and produced altruistically and super motivated this um, structure. I don't know if it's um, as evidence to you here, but in the Valencian community, we really are living in emergency because we don't have enough housing. Um, this is information from the Observatory of Housing. From 2019, we have been telling our public administrations that um, we are in a situation where we need to act. And administrations um, have ignored this call or this cry for help. Here you see um, the 
number of new housing um, for sale in um, Valencia. And it's very difficult to know how how many houses and how much property or real estate is being sold in a um, in a place. Um, and really, the difference is that the people that um, include houses or properties in um, a selling portal, a real estate portal, the prices are those that the owners wish to get. But here we did an analysis and a, comp a comparison of new constructions. Um, basically, what you see here is how the number of real estate promotions existed and how they are decreasing. We see that there is a drastic fall. And what about the price? Well, what happens in all markets? The price um, increases if there is little offer. So we got to a point where we are in an extreme situation. What's happening in the last quarters um, is really driving us crazy in our chair because we analyze the two parameters, the offer and the demand, and we do this analysis very carefully and we project from the results analyzing 40 transversal indicators that um, include the use of the port and the movement in the port, the use of buses, um, the health care and pediatrics um, attention. We analyze all of this to understand the real demand and we have an indicator that has become statistically, um, well, it's the most weighty indicator, which is the fact that the offer is so low that demand has gone through the roof. So the price of housing, if it's private, has gone crazy. We should have done something many years ago, and I really enjoyed today um, seeing the projects that were presented from Bilbao, from Pamplona um, and in different um, autonomous regions. And we're a little late to take action now, but right now we see here in this um, chart the average price um, of um, per square meter. We have even 7,000 um, euros per square meter. We, and we have nothing below 2,500 euros per square meters. This is the Valencian metropolitan area with more than 2 million inhabitants. Sadly, this is not something that's happening only in the city. The metropolitan area absorbed the impact of the lack of housing offer in the city. Um, and a few years ago, um, and I urge you to come and visit Valencia, what we did a few years ago was understand um, the parameters. So if somebody wanted to live in this part of the city, how much money would they have to earn? What does 400,000 euros um, for a property imply? We started to link it to the income that someone would have to have. And it has been very interesting. And this is before the interest rates increased. Now, um, things are really getting out of hand. With regards to offer in rents, rental properties, we have had months, about two months ago, where the 68 neighborhoods of the city had a rent um, price that was higher than what you paid for your mortgage. This situation is unbearable. So what happened to second-hand um, properties? It has decreased, the offer has decreased, because facing such rental prices, um, people don't no longer sell, they rent. And with the new law that was implemented, or that is going to be implemented, this is going to be affected even further. And we're not going to see an increase of the offer. What I wanted to really point to with this is the different options 
that we have when uh, we want to build something that is um, affordable. But we have many conditioning factors. And, and they don't only apply to the Valencian community, but to the whole of Spain. What we see as conditioning factors um, are, on the one hand, the construction costs, which have increased disproportionately. No one can bear um, the increase of um, prices um, that has happened in the last three years. And um, the materials and in prices increase, and therefore it has, the price of <coughs> housing has to increase. The lack of specialized um, workers. So I have um, a construction, I, sorry, I have an architectural firm. <coughs> and um, the, un the university professor in me and the architectural firm um, manager in me come together in this craziness, really. So the lack of um, workforce to carry out all of the construction that we have to um, do is crazy. We also have lack of materials. The, ma the model that we depended on, that we had created, meant that we could move materials from very far away um, places like China. But this shortage of these materials has had an impact. If we put all of these elements together, um, like I say to real estate promoters, you have to be very brave to decide that some that a project is viable. Um, then on the side of demand, there's a very, very high demand. But let's not go um, crazy and think that demand has a lot of possibility of to buy because salaries are what they are. And sadly, we can't do much to increase them. The social segregation that we are seeing is very drastic and we are seeing interventions in um, properties that yield very strange results because social housing has to be an integrating element. And we must be careful. I have a, um, quite a lot of connection with um, Latin America, and they there um, have um, favelas, and I'm direct. I'm in contact with them because of a PhD that I'm directing. That is about um, favelas and um, people settle in areas because they can't settle anywhere else, and they live in areas which are not um, healthy. They have to rent uh, rooms. So we are coming up against a situation that is not sustainable. There's a, l a lot of lack of land in many areas where it's actually necessary. And in our case, in the Valencian community, there's a great lack of um, social housing. We have had very little constructed and we have we are now suffering the consequences. We talk a lot about um, housing. Ten years ago I went to Vienna. What you see there, the very colourful building is social housing from a long time ago, and I'm not going to go into it um, in depth, but I'm going to point out a few things that we should learn from the Vienna model. When did this story start? It comes from the First World War, where Vienna, when Vienna um, has terrible health conditions. We um, get to the um, period where um, everyone decides that it's important to create housing in Vienna. The first solution that um, came into effect is the expropriation of unoccupied housing. The next one was rent freezing. And the next one was the prohibition of evictions. Does this sound familiar to you? I've only have, I only have a minute, apparently. So all of this, they came to the conclusion that it didn't work. And they started to build. They 
started to build. Bueno, ¿cuál es? ¿Cuál es la lección de Viena? What we need to learn from them is that 80% of the people that live in Vienna um, are candidates to live in social housing, even if you have a salary of 50,000 euros a month, a year. These are examples of that since the 1920s, really, we've followed that policy in Vienna. Why did I talk about technology and humanity? Because there are tools. This is the other part of my uh, professional career. We are creating industrialized buildings, which are which allow us to um, see. Um, we reduce our execution time by 50%. It costs 30% less, and we produce 40% less of waste and emissions. We also um, manage to get quality workforce in an environment that people want to work in, even um, ladies as well. Perhaps women will be part of these projects. BIM, we have used it, and the project that you um, have just seen that we have executed, we use it for the analysis of all of the parameters. Because industrialized um, construction is possible when we have digital modeling that is perfect. In our school, um, we have um, a printer that prints houses robotics will allow this to happen. So there are ways to make construction and building efficient using graphene, using wood, um, SATE for um, renovation in buildings. And we have AI. I use AI for my construction projects to understand um, and visualize what I'm doing. And then uh, moving on to the um, next, what we propose is sustainable prototypes. And we can use sustainable prototypes by using BIM and um, industrializing it in social housing with the amount of land that can be used up. Um, we can produce in series, and it doesn't have to be ugly, um, prototypes that integrate, so we have a mix of incomes, harmonization of um, social housing regulations, and sadly I am surprised by the um, regulations that we have in this country. We should have um, a government pact agreement. We need to learn from the different autonomous regions, and of course we must collaborate. Public, um, The public and private entities must collaborate. Um, real estate promoters should do so, and we should, um, they, um, of course, um, assume the risk, and the public administration can have social housing without supporting the direct costs, so that we can actually have the rights that is stated in our constitution, the right to a decent and adequate housing, which is not for free. We must guarantee access to housing for all, but without it being exorbitantly expensive. Thank you very much for your attention. The second presentation in this block will be given by Javier Terrados from the Technical Advanced School of Architecture at the University of Seville. He has a PhD in architecture and also a professor at the Advanced Technical Architecture School in Seville since 1988. He's been guest professor at different international and national universities. In terms of his work as a researcher, we can highlight the prototype of um, undisassemblable property for uh, temp temporary uh, workers in Cartaya. He's also worked on Solar Kit Patio 2.012 for the international competition on. S sustainable building, the Catherine 
10 T10 2012, uh, winning different partial awards and the second general award or prize. His uh, projects have received different awards, prizes, the 2005 National Prize, the 2005 National Prize of the National Association of uh, Architects in Spain and also one of the main prizes. Um, the title of his presentation is Industrialization in H Housing, Form versus Reality. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this International Congress. And I reiterate what my colleagues who say, uh, said before, the organization has been impeccable and I love this in these type of events when they're organized, particularly in this way. I'm going to link up with some of the comments made previously because I'm going to talk about industrialization. Firstly, from the academic standpoint, I've always felt that what we can teach about industrialization in the modern movement and modern architecture can be summarized via an anecdote. In 1935, Le Corbusier visited the Ford factory, the Ford vehicle factory in um, um, River Rouge in Detroit, and he was a great writer, and he said that I've in France, for a thousand dollars, you wouldn't even obtain a quarter of a home, but here for a thousand dollars, they'll give you a car. How is it possible that for a thousand dollars, I can have this combination of effectiveness, technology, material, and everything else? This notion, this idea, this concept, this imagined image of technology associated with automobiles, the paradigm of technology, in other cases, airplanes actually flooded all of the images that we've seen in modern architecture. The great authors, Franco Wright, Albert Alto, whenever we imagine them, they all examined industrialized building because this concept that houses could be manufactured like cars and for a thousand dollars you can have something more than just a tiny room or a meter squared. This found a place in modern architecture, but something has happened since last century that's evident and it's been described by an author, Gilbert Helbert, that we've all read uh, very much in a text entitled The Dream of Prefabricated Industry. Humanity is immersed in this fight for industrialization, but everything in the 20th century has been a failure. The 20th century is the history of failure. It's a story of failure because none of these authors managed to build a industrial building. Well, we've all written a lot about this, those of us who specialized in uh, PhDs or in these type of events, we've dug in deep into these points. Firstly, from a theoretical standpoint, it's still striking to think of certain phrases when you read North American industrialization manuals of a more practical nature. And some writers say things like the industrialization of building has much less to do with architecture as it does with a business model. And that is something we consider to be a key. If we consider investigating this in more depth, in fact, my PhD was on this subject. This is my PhD, in fact. This was my PhD, this was my doctoral thesis. And we address this from the different perspective. Can we actually jump over to the other side of the ocean? Can we interiorize about industrialized buildings, constructing, and rather than being system theorists, can we be promoters? And this is a result of the work of a research group that was initiated in 2005, believing that the university could do more than just create systems. So they decided to build industrialized buildings. And this was the beginning of prototypes, such as this prototype here. This was the arcade prototype, which was based on a very simple idea, a system based on the scale of furniture. So in the, if you go to a shopping mall, you purchase a package and you're a, you buy uh, something from a place like Ikea, you can, uh, you can assemble your own furniture. And this was the idea that you can see here which appears here with the layout based on furniture type elements which can almost be constructed by hand manually almost like IKEA furniture. We managed to develop and build this prototype in Kartaya.
como modelo de residencia para temporary workers. As a model residence for temporary workers that could be disassembled. The difference with any uh, type of research that's being carried out by the university at the time was that the researchers were actually developers. So to a certain extent, we're working on a business model because the idea was not to investigate, to research. The idea was to obtain money, funds to do something which could be profitable. That same business model also allowed us, gave us opportunities to research for the development of the solar prototype. Here's an image of one of the prototypes that was manufactured with the same technology. These type of furniture type elements that can be manually assembled almost, they're prefabricated and assembled on site. And we were able to develop homes like these that were actually set up by the students. These are solar international solar competitions that originated in the United States and they've gradually been imported via franchises in Europe. These are based on the possibility of being able to develop prototype homes basically for students using sustainable technology and also with energy efficiency. In other words, self-sufficiency through photovoltaic energy. We developed the first prototype in Margate, the solar kit. It was a entirely closed kit. It was closed, almost like an Arab construction, in interconnected by small patios and powered by solar energy. Here you can see a prototype. This prototype was rather successful following the Cartaya prototype and after that we began to receive commissions, the creators of the system. This is a commission for Cartaya Town Council to develop a small settlement for temporary workers which would be associated with the strawberry sector. Um, we did it similar to the approach of furniture. How long, how much would it had to be purchased and how long would it take for us to manually assemble them by technical experts and this is the image of what was exhibited this type of micro city that had been was self-constructable and which could be disassembled according to the season this gave rise to new opportunities to develop other prototypes and to develop them at the university the sepulmas the patios 12.0 project for the year 2012 and here the idea of this project was to work on a business model that was even more radical. It was constructed, well it was planned and constructed between 2010 and 2012, which was precisely with the worst part of the 12, 2008 crisis. There was no money anywhere. It was, we were unable to get any funding. We had to obtain sponsorship for this. There was no money, but depending on what we could sell, we might obtain certain types of financing. And this is the image of the prototype. It's based on the idea of creating a type of patio. Again, I don't want to go into too much detail. That was formed by four prefabricated modules that are grouped around this patio, which could be adjusted using this type of wall, movable panels, and which would have shaded sections, which could also be adapted. From this perspective, you, this was the perspective that was used in a poster where the 60 sponsoring companies appeared. Each of those 60 sponsors, sponsors donated one of the elements and a few others donated the employment, donated the labour. And the assembly work was actually profitable to pay for other things, to pay the administration, etc. So I think that initial intention for the prefabrication design to be possible, at least at prototype level, had to be accompanied by a lot of hard work and really getting down to treating this as a business and becoming developers. And we had to develop a good relationship and collaboration with the developers. And after this, and there were certain repercussions in the press, we began, became the inventors of this system. We didn't realize perhaps at the time we actually took a step back and we did what everyone does at the university. Everything, we would develop systems to see if somebody would purchase, purchase them for their construction. For example, for this one in Rinconada, we developed a project for dis homes that could be disassembled, formed by modules, which are similar to the, in size to a lorry container and we were able to sell this idea to the city council pending uh, its acceptance by a developer 
And this gives you an idea of how this 20 home project was developed or another one for a tourist company using this concept of the Patios 12.0 project, developing a series of homes based on grouping prefabricated modules that could be transported by a lorry around a flexible patio, creating these type of tourist accommodation in the area of Conil in Cadiz. We sold a system. We didn't really focus on the business model. We've also developed a system for a Colombian company that asked us about the possibility of developing homes that could be disassembled for mining, uh, for mines and mining production areas. Very quickly again, the same company had a concrete subsidiary in Medellin in Colombia and they entrusted us with the development of a prototype project for prefabricated homes made from concrete. And we look back to the 1970s to determine what these type of house of cards structures were like in the 70s. And we proposed these type of prefabricated cube-like structures based on a sandwich style panel system, modular system, and with these load-bearing walls. This was referred to in the 1970s as a type of house of card structure and in this way we could increase the use of concrete uh, as we moved up levels and we also sold this idea to the company in question and finally in Vicesa this isn't the project that we did because the project's still open and we can't show you the results but this is an initial render of what we were able to do for temporary accommodation prefabricated for uh, for example relocating people while social housing is being refurbished or rehabilitated there's this project here thank you and basically it was one lorry per day one home one lorry a day one home and here you can see the process. It was a, like, a central module. Well, it was actually two modules. The lorry. Everything would fit on a lorry. Two modules. The entire installation elements are here. And the rest of the construction is set up around this light structure with these very light profiles and also sandwich type panels. It was a highly developed, these are highly developed projects, but they're still projects on paper. So, in terms of drawn architecture, it's a very interesting project, but it ended up there and no more. We could probably say that the major enemy. Oh, the, I've skipped this unfortunately <laughs> these are projects that were developed by our studio and these are properties that we were able to develop these are buildings that we developed in the same period so as research advanced in relation to industrialization in the academic sphere in the university, the world was still turning. So we carried out projects in Conil, Jaén, Antequera, Seville, and then Seville again, Jerez, Terra Frontera. So the world continues with its normal systems. We normally say that there's two reasons for this. This occurs due to the price bank Bruno Levski. One well, of those who are familiar with the history of, his, of architecture during the Renaissance, he was the person who developed the concept of uh, work efficiency when he designed the dome in Florence. Lesky wasn't somebody that was already working in the quarry sector, he was a agriculturist, a painter, and he was the first person who developed, it said, a architectural project from the outside, from outside the world of construction. And the second was the price bank, because there's no price bank for industrialization, because in, no price bank would calibrate costs in time, determining on how we're doing with the developer, how we can save costs. So there's no way in which we're able to assess or evaluate with precision what occurs when you present a project, because the price bank cannot do this. 
It can do this if we go back to the idea of prototypes, if you're within the scope of the business model, if you're actually embedded in the production sector. And I'll conclude now. I'll give you an example here of something that's happening today. This is not a housing development. It's a project that we developed in Cordoba. And I'm going to show you this as an introduction to what's going to follow. This was or produced using prefabricated concrete, white concrete slabs. These are prefabricated elements. But during this construction process, we were able to contact a, a facade fabric, a manufacturer, a production company, and we were able to learn about their production and business processes. Therefore, in certain other projects that we're involved in, in other residential housing projects, we're able to incorporate this. And I would like to end here. If you're working and operating within the system, I'm not talking about participating directly in the business. You may not be a business partner, but if you're involved in production and you know how things are done, you can evaluate costs and you can actually start working before the project starts, then we can engage in real industrialization with a company. This is taking place in Spain. So we're doing something similar to Bruno Levski. We're positioning architectural studios before the construction of the development with the developer before the project ends. This means that we can design industrialized systems with them, because on paper it's very difficult to do this. You're either the developer or you're in contact with the business model via prototypes, and then you can find the way in which you can obtain profits and optimize costs, weight, etc., or you're with the developer, the builder. And I'd just like to end with the Le Corbusier anecdote while he wrote this. He said that for a thousand euros, I can see this light, um, efficient architecture, it's wonderful. Henry Ford wrote, Henry Ford wrote something very similar and said, this is amazing, this is very light architecture. But in the next paragraph he said, and with little weight, the less you include, the great, the more you can save. That's all, thank you. Van tomando asiento, continuamos con la mesa redonda. Justo cuando termine tenemos tiempo ya de tomarnos un café, quien quiera otro café, un refresco. Y vamos un poco acomodando a los componentes de esta mesa redonda, de este bloque de industrialización y digitalización, construcción 4.0. Hola, ¿qué tal? Vayan tomando asiento. Mesa redonda. Voy presentando mientras, ¿vale? Introduce y modera esta mesa redonda Ignacio Peinado Guerrero de Fadeco Promotores. Es ingeniero de caminos, canales y puertos de la Universidad de Granada. Habiendo Nair, from the University of Granada, he is carried out and civil engineering by the University uh, Masters by the University of Sheffield, and he started his career in the Santander Global Property of Grupo Santander, and he worked in Casa de la Subtorre Sociedad um, SA, where he promoted more than 2,000 um, uh, properties as an executive general manager. Before being part of Urbania, he was um, general director, a member of the um, managing committee of Neynor Homes, and now he's the president of Fadeco. Ignacio? Where are you, Ignacio? Hi. <laughs> Welcome, Ignacio. I'm going to um, present everyone's bi biographies and I leave it in your hands, capable hands. 
members of the round table Juan Carlos del Pino, Director General of Avra, the um, Building and Rehabilitation Agency of Andalucía. He's in charge of creating and managing this international conference. Congratulations. Um, degree in Building Engineering by the University Camilo José Tirar, Technical Architect, University of Seville, and a Master's um, in the University of Granada, Vice President of the um, Land Managers of Andalucía and member of the Urban Tourism, Social Economy and Urban Planning Committees in Andalucía and he's representative of um, the Logistics Network of Andalucía. He has co-authored many papers and um, he has been recognized by the um, Spanish Technical Architecture um, Association of Spain. Hello, Juan Velayos, founder of CEO of and CEO of JV20, law degree and MBA in IES, and founder and CEO of JW20. And previously, he was a partner. Um, uh, of uh, several architectural firms, and he walked for, worked for Price Waterhouse Coopers. He has been CEO of Mexta Africa, Naynor Holmes, the real estate promoter, um, who was floated on the stock exchange in 2017. Another of our speakers, Juan Antonio Gómez Pintado, president of the Agora Corporation. He has been president of Agocer en Via Celere, and currently he is the president of the Via Agora um, United States Rabident um, Corporation. And in 2014, he became the president of the um, Real Estate Promoters Association in Madrid. And he also shares the pre with this the presidency of the Promoters Association of Spain. He's a um, professor um, of the Polytechnic um, School of Madrid and also Unai Borroño Oreta, director of um, f um, commercial um, holdings and marketing, Unai um, Borroño of Egoin. I would like to start by posing a question. Um, Don Juan Antonio, I would like to ask you. La agencia de Andalucía ahora pues da con Juan Carlos haciendo proyectos en madera. Pero cómo llegará esta apuesta al resto de players, ¿no? De que todavía no están. Por amor o por dolor. <laughs> pues de, debería ser, debería ser por amor pero me temo que va a ser por dolor al final, ¿no? Eh, entonces, eh, estamos, estamos viviendo unos momentos, yo creo... Bueno, buenas tardes, que no he dicho nada, perdón. Eh, estamos viviendo unos momentos, yo creo que eh, intensos, diferentes, respecto de la escasez de mano de obra, yo creo que se habrá eh, comentado durante estas jornadas, y, y probablemente nos vamos a ver abocados, no, probablemente seguro, nos vemos a, abocados a, a trabajar de otra manera, con otros modelos, otros sistemas, y no me cabe ninguna duda que la industrialización es el camino para, para hacer de nuestro sector un sector mucho más eficiente y productivo. Juan, bueno, Juan fue mi jefe en Neynor, pues me he puesto lejos. ¿no? Te, pones, te pones lejos, mío, por eso. He estado atento a, a, la siguiente, a las intervenciones de antes, ¿no? Y hay algo que sí me gustaría preguntarte, Juan, tu opinión sobre la incidencia que puede tener la industrialización y la industrialización madera ya no en los costes de construcción en la mano de obra, sino algo que alguna vez te he oído apuntar importante, en la financiación. Que al final los inversores acuden al mercado a, a coger capital. ¿Va a tener incidencia? Eh, sí, va a tener, yo creo, que mucho más rápido de lo que nos creemos. O sea, al final, este proceso yo creo que... Eh, y, y lo escuchaba antes y lo escuchaba, o sea, al final llevamos mil años hablando de industrialización y que llega, que llega, que llega, pero que no llega, ¿no? Pero de repente estas cosas es un día rompe. Um, when it happens, it happens very, very quickly. Porque ya se ha entendido. Because now we understand. Ya está pasando. O sea, ya and we are at the right time. So it's the, when um, something like this um, gains inertia, it's not something that happens from one day to the next, but um, it, the process has started and one of the aspects that it's going to impulse this dramatically and accelerate it 
is metal, the lack thereof, we have understood painfully that it is not um, viable to have um, um, sustainability um, slash industrialization with metal. So when I talk to um, investors, um, I say, are you going to be able to compete with me uh, when I build different buildings in wood and you're going to build them um, in the old construction way? Well, um, your assets are going to be uh, less um, sellable than mine. So this time has come. And the people that you didn't believe this now understand that this is not com a competitive advantage, that they can't compete. So now it, the time has come for uh, to face the execution challenge. But we have wind in our sails, and I think this is key, because capital will be invested in innovation, not in traditional. And I think in the next 15 years, 30% of the um, workforce of our sector will um, retire and we are not able to attract enough young workforce. So this is progressive, so it's not going to happen from now to 15 years. It's going to be a progressive issue. And if now we have workforce issues, we'll have more in 5, 10, and 15 years. I don't know if you have read the book, um, Who Took My Cheese? Quien se ha llevado mi queso? And that is what's happening with real estate promoters. The story is versus of on an experiment where mice um, are provided cheese always in the same place and then they take it away yet the mice go always to the same place the mice are real estate promoters and we still keep going to the same place to see if it's going to work so this is not going to be the case so painfully we shall learn the lesson but it will be a quick learning curve the lack of workforce and thus the increase of industrialization as a system to palliate this, this will have to go hand in hand with um, workforce that can be recycled and repurposed for this industrialization. Will they be able to repurpose their training? Um, vocational training is going to be key because um, we as um, business owners have to make this dignified um, endeavor. So vocational um, training is going to be very important. And first of all, I believe that what we have to do is um, train and provide good training and value it. With regards to the industrial sectors, the environment where we produce materials have to be more regulated, more mecha mechanic, um, robotic and automated. And I think this will call um, to us workforce that is younger and that makes our sector more attractive. But let us not lie to ourselves. Nobody is going to develop um, all of this technological advancement for us, so we have to work together, universities, administrations, public and private um, actors. And for this, we need a vocational training and training that adapts to the model that companies need. So the programs need, uh, the educational programs have to be adapted to what businesses need so that students, when they um, come out, have the right knowledge and they don't have to be retrained within businesses. We also need a collaboration between universities, uh, vocational training, businesses and administrations. We have to collaborate. It's the only way to dignify this professional path. And that will allow us to attract good workforce um, and not only men, which traditionally work in this um, building 
sector, but also women, attracting women, not in terms of equality, which is important, but also in terms of making this industry more attractive, because we want both of them to participate. Thank you very much, Juan Antonio. Juan Carlos, Director General of ABRA. The public administration is using incentives, um, is supporting real estate promoters, and is um, using, is guiding by example. So, wood and industrialization. I see that you are um, fostering a pilot program. Please tell us. I agree with Juan Antonio in that that transition to industrialization has um, different phases and requires an ecosystem of um, the administration, businesses and um, training that they all work together. But in my opinion, um, businesses and business um, environments are the ones that are going to push forth the implementation of these processes. This is not romanticism, really. It's going to be something that we're going to do painfully, but we need to do it because the lack of workforce, the increase of prices, and the lack of vocational training adapted really is necessary so that we can um, face the great demand of um, housing that exists and we have to find a way to find a solution. From the public administrations, we have to pilot projects that um, serve as an example and that um, provide these as initiatives and real options and on our behalf we really have told um, very well here in this conference and have shared with you the actions that we are carrying out but um, our construction initiatives um, use innovation innovative systems and innovative materials. We have signed a protocol with the University of Granada by which um, Avra uh, takes a step further um, by providing um, public um, land in which a project is going for which a project is going to be developed using mixed um, concrete and poplar wood to use this as a possibility of implementing these um, these different elements reducing the carbon footprint and foster the local industry so that we can continue growing poplars and this is also interesting for young people um, it's going to be a project to house uh, young people and we want to also give them a chance to um, leave their homes but of course it um, fosters industrialization in terms of the number of homes that are going to be offered and also these soft loans it seems that um, there's going to be substantial support to housing which will increase and improve accessibility and that's also a great opportunity and let's see if that is ultimately achieved and it would be great if this is something that's achieved together with sustainability and efficiency and innovation so it's important that we don't miss that opportunity but Unai Will there be a barrier to entry in this business, which will be determined by singular buildings and creativity? These are architects who design like iconic buildings and like to revel in industrialization. Will this create barriers? No, I don't think so. That combination of um, buildings and industrialization already exists. A, we've talked about good architects today. It's important that the architecture projects are good based on collaboration, incorporating state-of-the-art software. It's important for the projects to be of excellent quality. So architects have to work with the materiality of the products that are going to be used in those buildings with good knowledge of his or of their strong points, their weaknesses and in collaboration called collaborative projects also make sure that industry is on board from the very beginning 
to ensure that the efforts that are made in those projects, as we heard from in that presentation regarding BIM systems, avoiding the duplication of the tasks so that the, each task is performed only once. So with this variety of products and also the amazing design capabilities of architects come up with some really good projects. I don't see any limits there. Does anyone want to be a little more controversial or not? Well, I believe that architecture is a profession. Well, I believe that design and industrialization is even more important, in my opinion. But I believe it's a profession that will evolve. Of course, there will continue to be iconic projects. There has to be, and there will be these unique projects. There is a niche market for this type of architecture, but industrialization is all about standardization. And the genius that is embedded and imbued in those designs, well, there's certain buts there I have to, I, I disagree. Uh, he doesn't look like he's an architect, does he? I think that there is going to be a clear evolution in this respect. It will be absolutely necessary, but a certain degree of reinvention is necessary. But the architect will have to adapt to the project and the demand. It's not the same to design an iconic building as an industrialized building. They're completely different things. So the architect will have to adapt to the requirements of each project. Of course, that's essential, but the architect will have to evolve. One thing that's happening to me, at least, we're designing traditional buildings, but with wood. But it's not, that's not what it's about. We will have building, we have to design buildings, which we have to design buildings which are made for incorporating wood. So there is going to be a certain degree of evolution. The architect will have to uh, evolve with industrialization. And I think we've heard this very recently. There's been a lot of talk about new technological systems which are being incorporated in design processes, as well as AI. Artificial intelligence, well, as perhaps creating certain uncertainty. And some of these new tools will be able to provide solutions or new formulae for addressing those solutions. But definitely, the traditional method that we're accustomed to dealing with in construction processes, in industrial processes, changed completely because everything has to be designed and pre designed right down to the finest detail. There cannot be decisions which will be taken during the assembly phase because that analysis, that architectural and execution analysis has to be performed in the prior phase. And in my opinion, this is going to require us to adapt. But I don't think that this really goes against or undermines genius and the unique nature of certain designs. I think they're perfectly compatible. Well, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend. I had to leave the auditorium and I'm not sure if you had the the opportunity to listen to Alberto Bayona's presentation from Naturvinza. We've just completed a project that's been a great success. And it's a project which incorporates design with wonderful architects. They're not divine, but they're wonderful. And there were certain things that had to be redone, but thanks to the prior work, it's proving to be a success. But it was a fully industrialized project. From the roof, ceilings down to the garage, well, five floors for homes, for residential properties, with a developer, a construction company that's understood exactly what's required. I'm not sure if you had the opportunity to see some examples in the previous presentation. Well, listen, we always like to compare. And we always like to compare our sector with the automobile sector. And I think that Juan is correct. At the end of the day, it's all about repetition. Industrialization is about repetition. This doesn't mean that the model which will be repeated will be a model that doesn't present or doesn't have any architectural quality. None of us would consider that in a car production line, every car that's manufactured will be different in shape. That doesn't make sense. So it's all about repetition, standardization. And with a view to the future, there is a problem of accessibility that has to be addressed, and it's all about costs. You can industrialize 
developing a wonderful architecture of projects on paper, but you have to consider the cost. Can it be industrialized? Well, it can, but at what cost? It's all about costs, about accessibility. I'm referring to the residential sector, of course. You know, in other areas of real estate, there's different approaches, but costs is important. We have to address a tremendous social problem that we have. So first, we have to talk about labor. Secondly, the lack of accessibility, the lack of industrialization. And thirdly, the lack of the capacity to ensure accessibility to the residential park for large segments of society. So the more we're able to standardize, and this doesn't have to clash with having wonderful facades in our buildings, it shouldn't be a problem. But until we understand that industrialization involves a process in which you have to perform engineering and designs where you will transform BIM language to machine code in a production line, you have to roboticize that production line, that manufacturing line, and use this and apply this in a development for 50 homes, well, it's impossible to industrialize that. You need to have two. So when you do the design engineering and you transfer this to the machine, then you actually operate the machine, which will help you to reduce the co construction costs. And in this way, we're able to make the properties much more accessible. I think that the concept and principle of industrialization is all about uh, repetition. There's something I've heard on other occasions and I'm sure that architects have said this very often. People say that all land is different. They're all different. They all have different shape, a different form. So, the other day somebody said, well, bodies are exactly the same. All bodies are different. And perhaps we haven't seen the leader of uh, construction is somebody called Amanthi Ortega who's able to do fast fashion and everything across the border and all of a sudden he's produced a thousand modern suits that you'll see on the catwalk in Paris or in Miami but these size M, L or S will fit anybody so I think that industry in industrialization in the construction center will probably be similar to the way in which industrialization is developed in the fashion or, or clothing sector. Well, as Carlos said before, we have perhaps abandoned uh, regenerative, regenerative architecture, which is all about using AI. But there will be a time, and it's just around the corner, because there are programs that are underway in which gen generative architecture are being developed. You would take a plot, you will incorporate certain urban development parameters, you'll tell the housing program that you want three, and you'll press click, and it'll do it for you. And that will be the same for any type of plot. And this is just around the corner, I can tell you. And I know that architectures and they'll probably cry out when they hear this. Will this give uh, leave a lot of room for design? Well, it will probably be a niche market and probably will have to address the social problems we face today. Well, we can do things differently, but just as they've done with cars. And you'll see how a model car is manufactured, but the next year they'll do something different because they'll adapt. But the manufacture of the car, robotic, robotics, industrialization will all be based on the same model. Well, I'm invested in a company, uh, Neynor Left, and then it's called Architectures, which is all about exactly what Juan Antonio said, and that was back in 2014 that these people came to see me. 2014, 2015, and I was asking them, well, what about my investment? How's it going? And, you know, they were always putting it off. And one day, well, they just shot through the roof. An architectos, after eight or nine years developing their initial projects, what they needed to have were all those parameters. Today, it's more than just a draft project. It's more than just a draft project. It's almost like a basic project. I wouldn't say that it's applicable to 100% of almost all plots, but the majority of plots that they develop. So well with HL boom how, how as happened with software what is happening with architects industry has to change we've said this but the professionals in the industry also have to change 
architects have to be on top of the latest trends and developments. They have to be aware of the programs that are being developed. And, you know, it may cost a fortune to be able to incorporate BIM in model development. We always come to these conferences and it seems like BIM's not really taken off. The problem is it's, take, it's very difficult for us to embrace this. So professional architects have to be really on top of what's happening if it's to do with software, generative architecture, whatever. And think about this, and this is also something that we can extrapolate to our schools and universities so that we can educate young professionals about the new technology that will be available and not think that they're going to be just focusing on the project, which is necessary, but we know that from a cost perspective that is less relevant. I would just like to explain an initiative that's being developed by the public administration when the process of uh, design in an innovative public procurement program for a development of our own digital system to develop protected social housing, uh, which is energy efficient. We're trying to develop this own system which can be adapted elsewhere because obviously we need to incorporate data from other catalogues in order to adapt it to different four types of sites. It's not just about the sites, but also the clearance in certain areas where there may be bridges and if you can't work in 3D you have to be able to work in 2D so in this respect our team is working very hard on this we've carried out the preliminary inquiries and we're going to announce a tender very shortly so that we're able to develop this project because at the end of the day the administration also has to incorporate these new models into our work as well uh, just one question and of all of the stakeholders in the chain, who is interested in this most? The investor, the constructor, the developer, the entrepreneur that's going to um, exploit that business? Who's got the most interest in this? Well, I would say those of us who are investing in industry, those of us who are developing this industry, Unai, Juan, myself, we have factories which are currently operating, and we're the first ones who are investing in projects. And we're not doing it through pain, but through love. Because we believe that the future of the sector will follow the path that we've all set. And the three of us have all selected a product would, each of us with different characteristics, but we're the first ones who are interested in ensuring its success. Firstly, because obviously we're investing funds, but this, there's no way around this. You either do it or you don't. There's obviously a steep learning curve at the beginning, but once you've got the labor, and this has occurred now with the strong commitment to social housing by three administrations, there we can also add the problem of rehabilitation. There's no other way around it. There's no other option. It's the only way to go. Because I think it interests all links in the production chain. We invested first. Obviously, we are interested in ensuring industrialization being successful, but it interests everyone in the production chain. But what's the greatest risk or the greatest cost? <coughs> well, in my opinion, it's due to the short-term vision. The short-term vision is who's taken my piece of the pie. Other people will say, well, don't talk to me what's going to happen in two years' time. Tell me what's going to happen tomorrow. It's important to have a long-term perspective on this because things change very quickly. And when the time comes for you to want to industrialize, you're going to have to um, tackle a very steep learning curve and it's going to be very difficult to get onto the curve on, and ride the wave. At the end of the day, um, construction companies don't do with, deal with figures very well. They will compare this estimate with this one. One that's industrialized and others that's not. It may evidently seem more economical. But what about the capital cost? Thinking about the time that you save with industrialization, capital cost, interest costs, we're all paying for those 6%. The opportunity cost. Reducing the time margin, and consequently in two years where we've been affected by the pandemic, of war, so the longer you, the, sh the more you reduce the execution of the project, the more certainty and security you will have. And these are all intangibles that you have to incorporate and take into account. And developers will only compare estimates today, nothing else. Yes, I agree. I don't think that anyone's going to get angry if I say this. The example of the mouse and the cheese is probably um, perhaps less appropriate. I think that 
developers have a short term vision. They want to stay in their comfort zone. And it's the same what I said before regarding the architecture, architects, that happens to developers and construction companies. You really have to get out of your comfort zone because we've all got to learn together. We've all got to learn many things that are not inherent to our sector. Industrialization is not inherent to our sector, architecture. And unfortunately, and this is possibly the case because it's a highly granular sector, a very localized sector, or because it's deeply rooted in the location where it operates. What industry is more deep rooted than ours, in fact? Therefore, there are a series of factors that have made it f something so obvious, so difficult. Because if we continue the way we're going, we're not going to get anywhere. So the only way that we can get around this is by imposing things via regulations. And regulations, just I have to mention this, have to be changed. 2018 all public buildings and you know if we continue with the initiative of the European Union by obligation we're going to have to deal with the CO2 emissions require regulations and incorporate more wood for example because otherwise there's no funds or because the bank is not going to authorize a loan because the license is not a green loan and they'll say, yeah, we want the green label. No, it's no, no, put the wood label on. Well, put the wood label on. We'll deal, we'll, we're happy with that. But anyway, the funding will not be granted. So there'll be a whole series of aspects that will be pain points and won't be done out of love. But I do believe that Vogue and Empty or Vacuous Sustainability, and there's a lot of that as well. A lot of people have jumped on that bandwagon. Many people will only contract us as architects because it's in Vogue. But they're days are short, the days of that are short. And there's another clear aspect, deadlines. You know, we're all beginning to know about investment. And if you say, well, put that in the Excel, put two more of the TIR rate in the Excel sheet. I think the winds are in our favor, but there's only one problem in my opinion that will probably make lots of mistakes because it's not easy. There's a problem of execution. And we hope that those of us in the sector will manage to ride the storm. We've got to grow much more and we have to make sure that we do things well in a disciplined manner without focusing on just quick profits and making money fast. We have to be able to develop an industry from the very foundations. And for me, that's something I'm worried about. These things like fleeting fashions. You know, we're still like a baby in nappies. We'll all have to learn to walk and make mistakes on the way. Yes, 20 years ago, the first emblematic building that served as a lever was a private investment in in the Hackney neighborhood and it was built from wood for economical reasons because as Juan explained the impacts of the collateral impacts of its construction were measured the con impact of a nine-story building in the city for economic reasons not because it was made of wood and that was 20 years ago Juan was talking about um, um, Latir um, and the Jill. I want to talk about living and the um, real estate promotion, the, ex the use of a building, the value of the business um, really comes from generating less ex um, building costs and create more services for the tenants. Do you think that industrialization is going to help with that, to reduce costs with those centers, for instance? Um, and is it possible for um, takers to put on, uh, to, to have more weight at the end of the value change, chain? For me, um, 
my trick for sustainability by um, industrialization, um, I think we need buildings that are um, that that generate gel because they have to be sustainable, and it's more sellable for. Um, in a market, also, um, it is um, they are businesses that need to generate value. Um, if if you spend three hour, three years building and you want to sell in a reasonable life, timeline, it's important to have this um, this included into the plans, and. And the next big disruption is that a lot of money is invested and linked to the optimization of the design and use of a building and their technology has a lot to add. In my case, I don't know in everybody else's, but I currently um, we know that this we we have to do this um, in our company, but it's in our it's it within our priorities. So I think that um, digitalization linked to the use and exploitation of the building is the next big elephant in the room. Adi, which is um, a technological association, is developing and is going to sign the next agreement for the development of the collectivity of build buildings and cities. Right now, we don't um, actually have analysis capacity to um, of how buildings continue. We ana analyze until we um, give it to the people that have bought it, but or to the organizations. And up until now, there have been two different ways of understanding how one can monitor buildings. On the one hand, um, one that included metaverse and another one that included physically um, including sensors that would give you readings. And those two ways did not marry well. The different companies um, did not agree. And now they have agreed. And they have created a pressure group, and they are decidedly influencing on legislation that are coming from Europe. So in very little time, we will have to monitor within buildings what happens um, in our building, but also because it has an impact on what happens in cities. So connectivity is absolutely essential, and it's going to come very quickly. <coughs> Where are our risks? The fact that the tendency, the, the ramping up of this tendency um, might um, cause a problem. You mean industrialization? No, I think this is a, a road that we're now on and there's no turning back. There will be certain sectors that will be more, um, well, more cautious, but I think legislation is the one that's the main problem. There's an asymmetry, for instance, in terms of financing. If you have um, an industrialized building and you follow the um, legal framework of the um, Bank of Spain, it doesn't yet it doesn't allow them to finance um, a specific project because it doesn't follow the legal framework. So I think really it's the legal issues that are currently impeding the process of industrialization because it's very difficult to fight against the tax um, authorities and um, certain certain legislation. And for these two um, ministries or departments, it's difficult for them to not um, stop our progress. Banks who are in quite a stationary position tend to say that the Bank of Spain don't let doesn't really let me, but this will change. 
and really the status quo, the whole value chain will imply that those that don't adapt will find a million excuses um, to not do things. The cost will be different, the different plots will be different, that will, will have different impact. I went through an experience that was a disaster, the acoustics, the wood, status quo will therefore have an impact. And that is where we need the big um, organizations to push forward. In terms of the public administrations, I don't think, and I'm not saying we should penalize, although we should, but companies that are um, building and constructing a specific um, type of, um, they're designing buildings that are um, energy A classified. They are effort, they are putting a lot of effort into do, doing something correctly, so they should not be penalized. It's on the other hand, the companies that are, um, that produce C rating um, buildings should be the ones that are penalized. So from public administrations, it makes no sense to impose a specific type of building, yet they, they, they permit such a wide range of different building um, classifications. And we shouldn't um, appreciate or pay the same way those that do the work correctly and those that don't. An example, in the province of um, Borgogna, if you build in wood, because of the CO2 negative um, impact that it has, therefore reducing the impact, it increases their possibility to build. Someone that is building more expensively but that is bearing the environment in mind, in fact, the, the public administration in Borgogna um, is providing them with 30% more of um, construction viability. So there can't be um, an imbalance because we have to have um, legal frameworks that allow us to, um, to promote the building sustainably, not allowing, for instance, C um, classification buildings. So that that way we push towards sustainable building. In this sense, I wanted to add that currently there's an opportunity and it'll be ongoing in terms of the um, public administration and uh, housing stock promotion. There's a lot of European funding um, directed and dedicated to um, sustainable housing being built. And we have time frames that need to be met and I think industrialization is not necessary but because of its very nature of allowing us to build quicker it's in itself we are pushing things forward the um, banking institution um, that um, are fostering this and they're providing funding um, and they are not um, and they they are also taking into, into consideration stockpiling we're really talking about m a lot of millions of euros so industrialization plays a fundamental role and now um, in the words of Juan Antonio um, from FADECO, which is the um, business association, we have already um, asked the um, Andalusian regional government to bear in mind that the businesses and the universities invest a lot of money in doing a lot of research, yet innovation um, is necessary and very simple within legal frameworks. 
um, Andalusian regional government approved this six bar 2021 law. Um, in hotels, if it, they were built sustainably, they increased the building capacity in 15 percent. That could be made extensive to the housing um, construction sector. And I think the Junta de Andalucía, Andalucía Regional Government, is working in the right direction. And so, to close, I will always ask each one of you to um, share your wisdom with regard to the future so that the architects cease to try and um, do everything. And so please, um, draw this to a close. I would say that accessibility, the accessibility to housing problem has a solution, but it is essential to use industrialization. Thank you, Juan Antonio. The use of wood in construction must increase, that we have more than plenty wood to meet the demand and increase, and that way we will um, um, increase the importance of rural areas so that there is a better management of forests and um, mountains so that we can have more wood um, for construction, less for wildfires. I would like to um, say that industrialization um, is essential to guarantee access to a dignified housing, which was said in a previous conf uh, intervention. I think talks around these topics and conferences structured around these topics are more and more nurturing and more enjoyable, and we're evolving towards a sector of which we are going to be very proud with industrialization, standardization, sustainability. I think our debates are richer and lovelier, and our profession and industry is making us very proud of what we do. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you all.